<laughs> wow, what an amazing day it was yesterday. Yesterday, as some of you that keep up with the news will know, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has decided to reassess the net zero um, plans. Not the goal, because the goal remains, net zero 2050 goal remains, but the plans on how to get there have been reassessed. And that includes the 2030 deadline for the ban of brand new petrol and diesel uh, engine cars. So the internal combustion engine cars, which originally they were supposed to be banned at 2030, with some hybrids allowed to continue until 2040. But yesterday he made the announcement, which I'm delighted about because it's something that I've been predicting for a long time, to extend that to 2035. Let's talk a little bit about what that means for you and me and the car industry. But also, there was one or two other surprises in there that I didn't even realize was being considered. What? I'll tell you right after this. A brown car guy. Brown car guy. Right, so as I've said, that ICE sales ban, ICE new car sales ban, has now been moved from 2030 by five years to 2035. Now, the reality is that actually that brings us in line with the rest of Europe, actually, because 2030 was ahead of the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe was 2035. And honestly speaking, even in, even in Europe, it doesn't seem likely that they're actually going to impose that uh, unilaterally because Germany and Italy have actually already put a spanner in the works. And it looks like that there will be an allowance made for internal combustion engines beyond 2035 in Europe uh, with the requirement that they be run on synthetic fuels, e-fuels, biofuels, etc. So we were already much more stringent and much harsher than the rest of Europe with the 2030 deadline. So that's now gone out the window. Well, I say that, but of course, this is always a game of political football, isn't it? You know, uh, Conservative Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has done this. Some would argue that he's done this because he's trying to win over the electoral vote. That could well be the case. But uh, on the other hand, he could be looking at, you know, the thing about Rishi is that he's quite, he's a bit of a, a numbers guy, isn't he? And he likes to do number crunching. He's had about a year in the job now to do a lot of number crunching and maybe, maybe crunching. And maybe he's just looked at the numbers and gone, actually, this doesn't make any sense. And that's what he actually said in his speech. And, uh, you know, in large part, I kind of agree with him, actually, to be honest. Now, he's, so what he's done is he's, he's, he's moved back, he's pushed back the ban on the petrol diesel cars by five years. But he's also relaxed, and I don't want to get too much into this other stuff, but he's also relaxed the rules on uh, boilers and heat pumps. And then there were a number of other things that he scrapped. Now, I just want to touch on this briefly because the things that he said he had scrapped, which is stuff that I didn't even know about, but things like having several different bins in your house, in your home, um, taxes on meat. What? I don't want an extra tax on my burger. Taxes on meat, taxes on flying abroad. And here's the big one that actually took me a bit by surprise. Some kind of legislation on the number of passengers you should or shouldn't be carrying in your car. Wow, I didn't even know that was coming. But apparently that's been scrapped as well. So overall, like I've said, I think this is great news, you know. And I know you guys do as well, let's be honest, because I put a poll up on this YouTube channel uh, yesterday, last night, when this actually happened. And over 2,600 people have already responded, probably more by the time you see this. They've already responded, and it's overwhelming. 92% welcome the move, the, the, the thing that Rishi has done, moving it from 2030 to 35, uh, 2035. So broadly, I think a lot of us are in agreement with what he's done. Um, and like I said, I think that what he's done is actually pragmatic because he's looked at the situation and he's gone, uh, you know, EVs are more expensive. It's going to take a while to, for people to make that transition because it's an expensive transition. Well, the main thing he's gone for is the cost of living crisis and the fact that we're enforcing these changes, we're inflicting these changes upon a country, a people in this country who are not really ready for them because we've just undergone the pandemic, the cost of living crisis, high interest rates, high energy prices. It's absolutely ridiculous to keep burdening the, the public with these things when actually they're government initiatives, you know, that, that's kind of the way to look at it, right? And um, so in that sense, I think that if that is the logic that he's using, and it appears to be the logic that he's using, and I do compare Rishi to a Vulcan, um, because the, the, the name Sunak sounds very Vulcan to me as well. And then if he is a Vulcan, maybe he is, maybe if he's a Vulcan, then it doesn't surprise me that he's applying logic. But what has happened since then, of course, there's been an outcry. Of course, there was going to be an outcry. Um, it's inevitable. A lot of people are saying this is just electioneering, which it, it, it could well be, you know. I mean, one of the things that happened recently with the ULA situation is that the Uxbridge by-election was a big wake-up call to everybody. 
and it alerted everybody that you know what you can't ignore the needs of the motorists you know and they're going to make their voices heard and they're going to do it through voting and then you're going to suffer so i think that you know um politicians at the top level suddenly realize that oh actually you know what we've got to think rethink these things because we're hurting people and i think this is the main thing they're hurting people but of course the green, green lobby is up in arms now if you saw the media it sounds like the car industry is up in arms as well. That's what the media is sort of portraying at the moment. That every time you come on, they say, oh, media is upset about it. The motoring industry is upset about it. And, and it makes sense. It does make sense. They often uh, uh, name check people like Ford and Stellantis. Stellantis, of course, Peugeot, Citroën, and all the rest of them. Alfa, Fiat. Um, and JLR, Jaguar Land Rover. And that makes sense because uh, J Stellantis has almost put all its, bag, all its eggs into the electric basket. It's going really heavily on that. Uh, across all of its multiple brands, you know, apart from its American arm, which of course is Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, um, which also are doing electric cars. In fact, Dodge is going to be putting out a muscle electric muscle car next year or year after. An incredible beast of a thing. And then you have people like uh, JLR, Tata owned, Indian owned, which of course is investing heavily in a, in a factory, in a battery factory, which I'll come back to in a minute. And then you've got Ford, and Ford have already said that they're going to lose 40% of their uh, workforce as they make the transition from ICE to EV. It's inevitable because, you know, they have to completely restructure the department, the R&D. They do a lot of R&D here. They, Ford do a lot of R&D here. But building engines, building combustion engines, they, 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 you know, and you can understand from their point of view, those, those manufacturers that took it for granted that the 2030 thing is a real thing. Manufacturers, of course, they spend a lot of money. They invest a lot of money. I've, I've spoken about this before. But when you're talking about model year cycles in terms of cars, Cars typically have five to seven year life cycle. Manufacturers were usually working one to two generations ahead. So they're already working on cars right now that are gonna come out on 2030 and beyond. So for them, it's a big pivot. It's like, well, hang on a minute. We, we just, we've just done this. We've invested all this money. You know, we've, we've done this. So you can understand that. And also then the dealer network has to be changed. The infrastructure has to be changed. A lot of people have invested in charging outlets and charging networks and stuff. So a lot of that is happening. So you can understand that a lot of those people are, are, are upset but at the same time, they have to show to be. They have to show that, don't they? They have to show that they're upset because they have to show that they don't like uncertainty. Because industry, business, economies don't like uncertainty. That's the reality of it. If it's uncertain, they don't know where to invest. They don't know how, where to build, where to buy, what to produce. You know, they don't know what to do. And there's still uncertainty, even with the 2035 thing. There is, like I said, because it could always be changed back. If, as is widely expected in the next election, uh, the Labour Party comes in and they'll probably put it back to 2030. But anyway. For the time being, it is what it is. But the reality is that there's a whole part of the motor industry, I believe, which is breathing a sigh of relief. Because the reality is that we're not really ready for it. You know, people aren't ready for it. The infrastructure appears not to be ready for it. It's growing, it's getting better. Electric car sales are growing, 16% of the market, 17% probably by the end of this year. Electric vehicles sold every 60 seconds. Makes sense, it's growing, people are adapting it. And that's fine, because for a lot of people it works. But for a lot of people, the charging infrastructure, the public charging infrastructure is not there. It's, not exp it's, it's too expensive. It's not as convenient as it should be. So ultimately, there's a lot of issues and people are really hesitating. And there's lots of other concerns about electric vehicles for the individual consumer motorists that have not been addressed yet. And also the technology itself is evolving and improving very quickly. Like every year, the range is increasing, the charging times are coming down, the cars are getting better. So it's still, we're still in the early stages. We're still in the nascent stages, you know? And it's gonna take a couple of model generations to really get these cars sorted and get the infrastructure sorted. So for a lot of people, it's like, oh, wow, thank goodness for this, because we can continue to do also what we know we know how to build, which is in the internal combustion engine car. And don't forget that we now have the deadline for 2035 for internal combustion engine cars, if that does stay in place. And that means that when 2034, until December 2034, you'll still be able to buy petrol and diesel cars, probably petrol cars. You'll still be able to buy petrol and diesel cars. So like as, uh, in an interview recently with Chiro of Petrol Hedonism, and he said that previously it was 2030, right? At that time it was still 2030. And he said that, you know, before 2030 happens, I'm going to go out and buy 20 cars. <laughs> you know, that almost makes sense if, you're, if you were able, if you're fortunate to be in that position to do so, and you had somewhere to store them, that would make sense, right? Go out and buy them, stick them in a warehouse somewhere, carry on using them if that's what you want. Petrol will be around for a while, and synthetic fuels will come along as well. So 
the other point being is that oh, all those people that are like oh, upset about it, it's like, oh no, but we are gearing up for electric cars and we need to encourage people to move to electric cars. Well, that's still happening and that will continue to happen. People are making that transition. You know, the point of the 2030, the point I've, the problem I've always had with the 2030 deadline is this whole thing about forcing people to move to EVs through legislation and punitive measures rather than encouraging them to move to EVs because EVs might be better for them. And people are smart. People make that decision themselves, you know. Look at the, look at the hybrid take up. Look at how people have taken up hybrids despite the initial hate that we, that we had for hybrids, you know. But ultimately people are like, oh, actually, you know, they make sense to me. I can use them. It saves me money. It's better for the environment. And I think ultimately people will make that decision. If you give them that choice, if you give them the facility, if you give them the chance to make that choice, ultimately people will make that choice, you know. And I think that's what, how it should work, rather than forcing people, rather than literally ban banning stuff is never a good idea. And I come from, the, I've been in, the, I lived in the Middle East. I know the impact that that has. So, banning stuff has never been a good idea. So we, and so in any case, we may already reach the target, the established target that was already there. Of the established target was actually only 80 percent by 2030. So even though, like, we had the deadline of 2030, the established target was actually only 80% of sales should be EVs by 2030. The rest 20% I'm assuming would be hybrids. By the way, I don't think hybrids will be allowed to continue beyond 2035. So I think the hybrid deadline will still be 2035 according to this new legislation. So I think that, you know, that, I don't think that much will change honestly, but I think that it gives people a bit of time. It gives people a bit of space, you know? We're not forcing people to fall in love, to, to move to an EV. We're encouraging them to take interest in it, maybe fall in love with them, you know? And for most people, to be honest, you know, a lot of people that are really worried and concerned about EVs, I mean, I've tested so many EVs recently. A lot of people, for a lot of ordinary motors, when they jump in them and they find out how smooth and easy they are to use, how quiet they are, how refined they are, for a lot of people, if they find that, oh, well, I can charge one at home and it covers my mileage, for a lot of people, it'd be the right choice, you know? And that's fine. People should have choice. People should be allowed to make that decision, you know, for themselves. Going back to the situation where all the green people are up in arms, you've got to keep in mind that Britain was ahead of the game. We were leading everybody in terms of our commitments to the environment. But in fact, Britain is only one, produces less than 1% of the total carbon emissions of the planet with 330 million tons. That's what the UK puts out, right? Per year, annually, right? Let's put that into, into context. China puts out 11 billion tons. 330 million, 11 billion. Even that is nearly double the next biggest polluter, which of course is America. The third biggest is India. But China is staggering. So when you think about that, when you think of the logic of that, first of all, you're forcing people into poverty here because you're forcing them to make changes uh, outside of their lifestyle, such as moving to electric cars, such as boilers and stuff. Well, I don't want to even get into that, but I, even I was, I'm terrified at the thought of, you know, in my apartment, changing a boiler at a cost of 13,000 pounds. Am, am I out of my mind? I'm not going to do that. But anyway, apart from forcing people into poverty, the reality is that this whole China thing with 11 billion tons of, of the CO2 that they're putting out, that's where the real issue lies. And actually by forcing us to do these things, by forcing us to move to EVs, aren't we exacerbating that? Aren't we actually making it worse? Because the reality is, like it or not, most of these EVs are coming from China. And if the EVs are not coming from the China, the battery packs are. Because China is the biggest producer of battery packs at the moment in the world, globally. That's where it's all coming from. So ultimately, every electric car that you're buying has Chinese stuff in it. Literally everything you're buying nowadays has Chinese aspects in it. But anyway, particularly with cars. And surely if you're going to do that, surely that's going to contribute more to the environment because that's just going to increase production in China, which is increase, increase their carbon emissions, which is not going to be 11 billion, it's going to be 15 billion. Where does our 330 million stand in that context? Not even a drop in the ocean. So moving to EVs literally seems like we're just going to make the situation worse, you know, by forcing that rush. Whereas a natural transition will give us time to build the gigafactories here. That's what we need. We need gigafactories. That's where we can break, create our own batteries. You know, Britain used to be the biggest exporter of cars in the world in the 1950s. We're a bit player now, but that could change. Given time, there is investment. Tata is investing with JLR. They're building a gigafactory. Nissan have a gigafactory. We need more of those. And when you do that, you reduce the carbon footprints because the cars, everything is manufactured locally, right? So you reduce the carbon footprints. So actually, it's not a bad idea to give ourselves a bit of time, A, to build the infrastructure, but B, also to create the infrastructure to build our own cars, to build our own EVs. And surely that's a good thing, right? And it does take time to do these things. You know, even to, um, to, to, to build a gigafactory is about four or five years, right? So, and, and, 
So, so, this, so I think that overall, this is a great move. I think that we'd also like to hear more now. We'd like to hear more, obviously, regarding things like ULEs and low emission zones, 15 minute cities, LTNs, 20 miles per hour limits. Because, you know, again, we're ranting and railing against these. If, if Rishi is all about reducing the burdens on ordinary people, getting the economy back up and running again, not slowing people down to this sluggish, you know, everybody goes on a bicycle and gets nowhere very fast, you know, this, this is not the way to do it. So I'm really hoping that, um, that it's not just about electioneering, it's not just about, you know, he's got the pulse of the nation and he's like, oh, okay, maybe people will vote for me if I do this. I'm hoping that it's actually about him uh, having applied thought, logic and analysis and gone, you know what, this is the right way of doing it. We can actually help our people and still achieve our targets and not make everybody's lives worse. As I said, hybrids will be stopped by 2035 as well. What I don't know about is something that I've discussed recently, which is a ZEV mandate. What is a ZEV mandate? The zero emission vehicle mandate. mandate. And just to remind everybody, what that, what that meant, if that was going to be introduced, it was going to be introduced from the 1st of January next year, so 2024. And what it was going to mean was that, well, last year, for example, 17% of sales, of now we are at that, um, are EVs it was going to be stipulated for every manufacturer that 22 percent of their sales would have to be evs and it would it would go up incrementally every year until it got to that 80 percent by 2030 and if manufacturers didn't hit that target they would be fined and they would be fined 15,000 pounds per car per vehicle that's how they, how much they would be fined so uh, that's why i'm saying that for some parts of the motor industry it's probably they're probably you know sighing massive relief right now you know um so what's going to happen to that? Uh, well, you know, the government has not responded to the public consultation on these new rules, which close in May. So we still don't know if that's going ahead. And now I think it's definitely up in the air. Now, just to, just to complete this thing about the car industry. And yeah, like I said, I mean, I fully sympathize and empathize with the car industry because, it, you know, it takes, it's a big lumbering giant. It doesn't move so quickly. It cannot move so quickly. So when you keep changing these rules, it's not good for any industry, especially the car industry. But why is it important to us? I'll just give you some facts and figures, yeah? The automotive industry, right? Um, the related, automotive related manufacturing contributes 78 billion pounds turnover to the UK economy, 16, bound, uh, 16 billion pounds ad added value to the UK economy, uh, it typically invests 3 billion pounds in research and development and R&D. There's 208,000 people employed in the automotive manufacturing sector, some 800,000 employed in total. Uh, across the wider sector. The industry trades globally and that's exports worth 94 billion pounds which account for 10% of all of UK's uh, uh, goods exports. There's more than 25 manuf manufacturing brands uh, that build more than 70 models here in the UK. So we still do build cars and we want to build electric cars, but we want the battery in the, but the gigafactories here as well, I think. Um, and yeah, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this is a very important part of what we do and who we are. So it's good to see that some logic is entering the discussion. Um, I hope that it doesn't change again because that will be completely destabilizing. You know, give the, give the people targets, do this. I mean, you know, a lot of people will say, can we just get rid of the ban entirely? And I would agree with that because ultimately, like I said, I want people to move to EVs by choice, not by force. But in any case, we have given them another time. I and mean, 2035 is, my math is terrible 12 years from now so it's a little bit more time than we had and that gives people time to think about making that transition anyway i'm sure i'll hear more from you guys on this so look forward to hearing your comments and i'll catch you all in the next video Brown card hope you enjoyed that video if you did please please hit the like button and share this video as well if you can and while you're at it check out these guys who also sponsor my content i am deeply grateful to them because it helps me to buy new equipment put fuel in the cars and yes buy a cup of coffee you can do the same just go here or right here on youtube just hit these three little dots down here and click on thanks make sure you're signed in first my content is free but this is how you can help me keep it that way i may even send you a gift oh by the way watch this next